Today we have Mika Taylor. Mika Taylor's short stories have appeared in Granta, Ninth Letter, The Kenyan Review, Tin House, Open Bar, and other publications. She was the 2015-16 Carol Houck Smith Fiction Fellow at the University of Wisconsin and earned an MFA from the University of Arizona. Uh, she lives in Willimantic, Connecticut, so one not too, but, but I have the same commute, basically, <laughs> an hour away. Uh, it's been a pleasure to read and discuss her short fiction with two of my classes this semester. She is a skillful storyteller, to say the least. She does not shy away from formal experiment, which has been a lot of fun to look at and talk about in our classes. Uh, and she also creates, I would say, an array of characters who are all at once odd, quirky, even otherworldly, and yet entirely familiar, a reflection of ourselves. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mika Taylor. Oh, thank you. Hi, thanks for coming out. Um, I brought a, a work in progress um, that I've been uh, working on this fall. I figured you guys have already read some of my stuff, so try out something new. I'm not sure about the ending. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, it's always a good learning experience to read it out loud. Um, this is called The Seamstress. The fingers of his skin suit fit perfectly over hers, as did the wrists and hands. Not because his hands were delicate or small, but because hers were thick and work-worn, and because she kept her own skin on when she slipped into his. The arms she had to pin and tuck under the pits, the torso she let out here and there, pulling and replacing stitches to accommodate her soft middle, her moderate breasts. She was careful not to leave marks or add new holes or show her work, but she was an expert seamstress. That's why he'd married her. There were other things between them, but those skills were her greatest asset, the one most relevant to a man who wore his skin as a suit during the day and shed it each night. When he was naked, red and exposed in his hyperbaric chamber, with its gel and its misters, its white noise machine and temperature controls, when she'd laid a stretch of silk across his lidless eyes, a mask over his nostril holes and toothy mouth, and closed the cover of his box earlier that night, she'd felt his equal. She was proud to tend and mend and moisturize to keep him whole. When she wore his skin, though, she felt more like she did when they were out together. She noticed all the ways he was larger than her, the places he was leaner and more fit. Even with padding, her shoulders didn't seem as broad or confident as his. Her back curved in quiet question. His face on hers was not his face. The cheeks sagged and the chin pulled, making her look both younger and older than either she or her husband. She could not have impersonated him. She might have been able to pass as a relative, a cousin or nephew, but never as the man himself. It was okay, that was not her intent. She did not desire to imitate him or to be him. She did not hold the delusion that by walking in his skin, she would, under, he would, un, excuse me, she would understand him any better. And yet, she could not help pulling it from its rack as he slept and fingering its edges before altering it in so many small ways. She could not help but catch a breath and slip into the skin that had, through the years, become more familiar than her own. Over it, she put on a second suit of worsted wool and lined it in, some, in the same silk she used to store his skin when she took it off. The silk slid up each leg, pulling all the small hairs gently against the grain. She folded the extra, extra flap of torso into a soft paunch and belted the trousers in place. A fleece pocket held the empty dandle between the legs. She buttoned her shirt high enough to hide the stitching at his throat and covered that with a padded jacket that masked just a little more the irregularities beneath. From vanity or from professional pride, she cut the wool to its most attractive fit. It starts edging in to emphasize the line of the waist and what shoulders there were. Next, she donned the specialized hairpiece and a pair of tinted glasses just dark enough to obscure her doubled lids and lashes. She left the apartment quietly, nodding to the doorman on her way out, then turned right onto Lexington and started downtown, taking long strides so that her husband's shoes wouldn't catch on the sidewalk as they often did when she'd first started. She'd learned to shove spun cotton in his, into his hollow toes to cushion her smaller feet, and then practiced in the apartment for weeks before developing the balance and reach to put each unwieldy foot in front of the other, rolling forward from ball to toe without a hitch. The stride gave her a purposeful air, and she would surely have walked all the way if it hadn't been such a warm night. With the layering of suits, she risked breaking a sweat and impregnating the skin with her smell. That would mean hours of extra washing and drying before she got home and before her husband woke. 
Instead, she raised an arm and hailed a taxi down to 14th Street. When she got there, she walked again, past toy stores for pets, bakeries ornate in rainbow displays, and bistros with signs painted to look centuries old. A young couple strolled by, whispering. Across the street, three teenagers with skateboards kicked up and off the curb, and the arrhythmic clack of wood on cement followed her for blocks. She paused only at clothing boutiques. Many in the area were consignment shops, but there were real designers too. One window was full of men's jeans that had been posed to look as if the legs were walking, jumping, crouched. In another window stood three mannequins in various stages of dress. Only one had a truly admirable fit, but the man who owned that suit would have to be perfectly mannequin-sized himself. She disdained clothing off the rack, but she knew that not all men had, their husbands, had her husband's resources. Not all could afford a tailor, and far fewer could marry one to keep him in dress. At the corner, a distinguished man with an open gaze walked right towards her, and she endeavored not to look away. Looking away drew more attention than a little measured eye contact. In her body, she went mostly unnoticed, but the polished glow of the skin and the fine cut of her suit drew more attention than her own dowdy looks. The secret was not to smile. Women smiled. A nod, perhaps, and a distant glare were enough to pass undetected. She walked by a store in whose windows sat racks of limp hanging clothes, a tantalizing bit of color, and a hint of a known designer drew her close. She'd never been a designer, had only ever assisted others in her early career. Most in her field were either artists or craftsmen, seldom both. Men's clothing especially owed more to tradition than innovation, and the skill of a craftsman far outshone the vision of most artists. Still, she knew artistry when she saw it, and could not help to admi but admire the elegance of a perfect drape. She turned onto Christopher Street and, with a little thrill, walked by the beautiful boys with their fresh haircuts and fitted jeans. They evaluated her with keen eyes, eyes that saw the cut of tailored slacks even under the street lights. These were men who, even if they couldn't afford better, made sure every item they wore flattered in the right places. She did not shy from their gazes, from taking them in. She nodded approval at the young ones who looked her over diffidently. A few of the more desperate seeming pushed their pelvises out in offering. Those two she passed. Up the block, an older man in loose Dior was lighting a cigarette when she slowed to admire his cuffs. He held his pack out to her, asking wordless, her wordlessly to join. She blushed underneath the face, declined politely, and turned the next corner without looking back. The heat traveled down her neck, and she had to stop a moment in a shadowed spot. Her heart refused to slow. She pictured the man's broad hand coming towards her again, cigarette proffered, eyes already alight. If she was being honest, that's what she was here for, that singular draw. She wanted to be seen. She'd been too bold, though. With men, there was risk. Men weren't afraid to approach you. Men weren't afraid to touch. Most expected a speed from meeting to bedroom that she couldn't afford. Their overt physicality drew her, but it was also a trap. She would never risk damaging the skin for a cheap thrill with some stranger. How thrilling could it even be? She couldn't feel human touch as more than pressure through the skin. Besides, the fasteners would be visible, the open holes at her hips. Even if she rigged up, some f up the flaccid space between her legs with some sort of device or insert, how could she be sure not to mar the finest and most delicate of parts? She checked her phone. There was still half an hour until her date. She'd set it up online so that she could pre-screen and plan. She'd chosen a woman her own age, one she knew would be grateful for a nice dinner and conversation, some wine to share, the kind of woman who would appreciate the attention and wouldn't push for more than a gentle kiss at the end of the evening. She went straight to the restaurant and took a seat at the bar where she nursed a glass of whiskey and waited. The woman's name was Janelle. She wore her hair long in a spiral perm that hadn't been in style for decades. Her profile listed music and travel as hobbies. They had nothing in common. The seamstress spotted her as soon as she walked in. Janelle wore an off-the-rack fuchsia shift and chunky jewelry. She had on more makeup than in her profile picture and seemed particularly uncomfortable, either because of the poorly made dress or the tight space <coughs> of the entryway. The, seam the seamstress let her wait another minute, watched her check her phone, glance around, and check again. She finished her drink, slipped off the bar stool, and crossed over with her confident stride. She touched Janelle's arm at the elbow and introduced herself. Janelle, Janelle said, a trace of lipstick on her front tooth. The sim signaled to the host who brought them to, a, to the corner table she'd reserved. She sat there with her back to the window where the bright 
streetlights behind would help avoid at least some scrutiny. That plus the candles on the table and the wine they'd soon drink made it so no date had ever looked too closely at her doubled lids or noticed the odd way her lips moved under her husband's when she ate. She listened to the specials and ordered a mid-range bottle of red. Janelle did not protest. I recommend the trout, the seamstress said. Women liked it when you took charge or seemed knowledgeable. Is that what you're having? asked Janelle. Or the prime rib, the seamstress said. The seamstress had been practicing, but she was not much better at dating than she had been before marriage. They read over their menus, but she still felt deeply the long pause in conversation. It really is a beautiful night, she tried. Yeah, said Janelle. Warm for this time of year. Mm-hmm, said Janelle. The seamstress shifted in her skin. Her husband was a man of few words, but he owned his silences and didn't seem to expect her to fill them. Dates, of course, were different. All of the getting to know one another required conversation. It was expected. She'd done her best when searching online to choose talkative types, the kind of women who would prattle on about themselves and fill the space so she would, didn't have to. She assume, she'd assumed from Janelle's lengthy and lightweight profile that she was just such a woman. Do you live around here? asked the seamstress, even though she knew from the dating profile that Janelle was from Jersey City. No, said Janelle, you? Tribeca, said the seamstress. It had seemed both neutral and up and coming when she chose it. And you're, an e and you're a legal aid, the seamstress said. Sure, said Janelle. And you're a software guy? Yep. The waiter returned with the bottle, and the seamstress relaxed into the ritual pour and swirl she'd seen so many times from her husband. She smelled it and held the glass up to the light. She tasted the wine and pretended to contemplate its nuance. She let the waiter fill their glasses, then raised hers. Janelle met it with her own. What are your hopes and dreams, the seamstress asked. Ha, said Janelle. Ha, ha, said the seamstress. Janelle looked back over her shoulder, maybe for the waiter, maybe for an exit. The seamstress eyed a straight thread on Janelle's shoulder. There really was no excuse for such carelessness. She sliced, a butter roll, but did, uh, she sliced and buttered a roll, but did not bother eating it. I haven't done this in a while, said the seamstress, even though she'd been in this very seat two nights before. Really, said Janelle, I do this way too much. She looked at the seamstress more closely then, as if taking her in for the first time. The seamstress sipped her wine and wiped her mouth so as to stay in motion. In motion, she was more convincing. You know how it is with these sites, lots of likes, and hey, you're beautiful, and nice guys trying to take you home, but then what? Either they don't call, and that's it, it was all a lie, or they do, and you're dating someone you don't even know. I'm not sure, I'm not even sure why I'd try. The seamstress refilled both of their glasses. To trying, she said. No offense or anything, Janelle said. I just don't know what to talk about with strangers. The seamstress waited. Like, am I supposed to tell you about my childhood or complain about work? I don't know, said the seamstress. How was work? Boring. What was your childhood like? It was okay. The seamstress had spent much of her own childhood in the back of her father's shop. She'd had few friends, but many dolls, cut together from scraps of cloth, pinstriped and paisley. She'd gone to grade school in Queens and then high school a few blocks south. When her father died, she dropped out to run his shop, but few of his customers had trusted a teenage girl with their suits, even though she'd been doing most of the sewing for years. The workmanship was still there, that she knew, but she lacked something in the fitting room, some ease of carriage that her father had inhabited naturally. Customers went cold under her touch, or worse, the middle-aged man with a gut like a sack of flour who'd petted her neck as she measured his inseam had then held her hand against him as he'd grown thick beneath the all-too-thin cloth. None of this seemed worth sharing. Janelle was right. They were strangers. The waiter brought their food and she focused on that. It was work to keep her mouth fully closed while she chewed. Cutlery was also difficult. Her nimble hands were clumsy in his, even though she'd spent hours at home relearning how to hold her fork and knife, how to cut her food and bring it to her mouth. The skin had become heavy, and the seamstress felt the heat of the wine. This was supposed to be easy. Ask questions, get answers, listen and laugh at the right intervals, and watch the women loosen. Smile and nod and let them talk about themselves and their lives and grow familiar over the course of the evening. So fuck it, said Janelle, between bites. I was married and now I'm not. Is that what you want to know? I hate it and I don't want to be here, but I'm sure you're perfectly nice or whatever, and I guess dating is better than crying. Or not. Janelle shoved a new potato in her mouth, then washed it down. He was a shithead, but I loved him. Why, the seamstress asked, before she could think. Janelle laughed for the first time that night. Probably because he was a shithead. That's how I'm built. Something in her voice made the seamstress want to reach out to her. Janelle flipped her hair, and the seamstress admired her thick jaw. The seamstress let her leg brunch, again, 
brush against Janelle's under the table. She felt only a slight pressure, but she imagined the texture of the wool against Janelle's nylon knee, the spark those two fabrics might create. Janelle shifted away, but met her eyes. There was no dampness at their corners. Besides, the sex was good, even the, in the end, said Janelle. The, sa the statement seemed cutting, as if Janelle knew the seamstress slept alone. When her husband had come to, into her shop and proposed to her that she take on this life, this partnership, the seamstress had assumed that sex would be part of their arrangement, that any man who trusted her with so much physical intimacy would eventually share his body in other ways as well. But that had never happened. It seemed he did not use the skin in that way at all, with anyone, ever. When she was cleaning it, she'd examined that place. Through her marriage, it remained pale and untouched, as soft and pliable as a child's. Maybe he had a mistress, another professional with skills necessary to elicit response with little to no damage. Maybe he'd perfected some sort of self-stimulation by which he could climax without touch. She herself had never been good at masturbating. She pursued it furiously, but only found herself mounting to higher and higher peaks, never breaking over or releasing, just accumulating a growing frustration, a storm of anger that pushed so hard she had to give it up altogether. There was a quieter joy to be found within his skin, the way its baby softness surrounded her, comforting and whole. You look beautiful tonight, said the seamstress. Janelle scoffed. There was something in her face that the seamstress couldn't identify. It was not attraction, that she understood, nor would it, was it indifference. It may have been pity, as if she sensed all of the complex expectation the seamstress had brought to this date. The raider returned with the dessert menus. No, thank you, said Janelle. I think we're done here. The waiter started clearing plates and the seamstress flipped him her credit card without asking for a bill. Uh, she downed what was left in her glass and upended the bottle before the waiter took it. Janelle checked her phone. I can handle this, the seamstress said. You don't have to wait. Janelle thanked her but didn't pretend to linger. She slung her knockoff purse over her shoulder and stood. The seamstress focused on the back of Janelle's dress. Its seams were even, its cut serviceable. There was no pilling and the fabric flowed well considering its quality. Outside, a light drizzle had slicked the streets and fogged store windows. There was still an hour at least before the seamstress had to be home. She wound her way through the damp snarl of the village until she found a bar that appealed. Not too much neon or noise. Inside, she ordered another whiskey. A serious drink for a serious man, said a stranger on the stool next to her. She hadn't noticed him when she'd sat down. He was smaller than she would have chosen, but he looked trim and cleanly dressed. She, she considered her reply, but he didn't, need to see, he didn't seem to need one. He was completely engaged with his phone. He showed her a picture of a shirtless man with gelled hair. Jackrabbit here says he's a buck sixty, maybe in high school. I can smell the muffin top cooking from here. He swiped to another picture and glanced towards a couple in the corner. Airbrush much? He thumbed through a few more, writing quick messages here and there. Where are you on here, honey? I'm not, said the seamstress. Serious and mysterious, he said, putting his phone down. He was not particularly handsome, so his confidence took her off guard. Mine's Danny, he said. What's yours? Ronald, she said. Ron. A serious name, he said, and a serious face. It was a comment she'd heard only when she was in her own skin. Here, it felt less like criticism and more like simple observation. Danny reached up to brush a lock of her hair. An inch further, he would have grazed the elastic edge of her hairpiece. She didn't pull back. There was attraction here, even through the layers between them. Such distant eyes, he said. All the better to see you with, my dear. She cringed, but Danny laughed. It was close enough to last call that this kind of terrible line got a pass. Before she knew, he'd ordered another round and laid a gentle hand on her thigh. She accepted a drink and let him talk to her. When his phone lit up, he turned it over and shifted his hand to a spot higher up her leg. He looked more closely at her face than she usually allowed. It was the face that had most inter interested her as well. From the first, she'd been fascinated by the details, its plasticity and resilience. The body she'd understood, it was a beautiful piece, but it seems and fasteners were all straightforward in their craftsmanship. There wasn't a stitch or cut that her father hadn't taught her early on. The face, though, went beyond anything she could make herself. It moved almost intuitively, and the muscles underneath could easily track through a full range of emotions. Whoever had made it had pulled and stretched the skin to its most perfect drape. That artistry had made it impossible for her to decline when her husband asked her to take on this strange vocation, this project of care. 
He'd offered to keep her shop open, to buy the building and let her work as much as she wanted for other customers. But as soon as she'd understood the scope and skill required to maintain his skin, she'd lost interest in simple fabrics and known patterns. She'd wanted only to study this one, to only to study this new, more challenging garment, to read up on leatherwork and taxidermy, anatomy and preservation. In him, she'd found her life's work, a thing worth perfecting. How could she have known that it would leave her wanting? Danny was still examining her. In fact, he was staring directly into her eyes when she felt the pressure of his hand shift to a point even higher up her leg. She drummed before he reached the top of her thigh and found what little was there. He pushed himself towards her and whispered sweetly, it's okay, baby, I can do the work. No, she said, no. She drew back further, knocking her bar stool to the floor. She caught herself, but not before banging her calf on its upturned leg. She stepped over the stool as she backed away and then fled, leaving Danny and her drink behind. When she'd made it a few blocks off, a coolness at her calf stopped her. The drizzle had turned to rain, so she ducked into a vestibule to examine herself. There was a rip in her suit. The stool leg had torn the wool and satin beneath beyond patching. She fingered the hole and was surprised to feel sensation on her calf. She looked closer but could not see through her misty glasses. On the sidewalk, a clump of women in heels shuttled each other along to the next bar. When they passed, she removed her glasses to better examine what looked like a fresh tear in her husband's skin. Rain dripped from her hairpiece down her brow and wet the space between her eyelids and her husband's so that his slipped shut over hers. She propped them open with her fingers but could not get a clear view of the damage. The hole was about an inch long, but she could not see if its edges were jagged or smooth. She needed, to look, she needed a better look. With a glance up the block, she slipped back into the shadows and unfastened the hairpiece. She tucked it in her pocket and unhooked the closures at the back of her skull, then eased the skin of, off of her neck and head first, uh, being sure not to stretch or distort it. Cool air filled the space between his face and hers, and she pulled the skin forward so it folded limply onto her chest. There was always a moment when she first exposed her own skin, a sensory shift where the world became louder, brighter, more immediate. Had she been at home, she would have done this all in the bathroom where she could keep her eyes closed and slip into the shower, bending her head under the water until the room steamed to a blur, staying there until the hot water ran out. Here on the street, the rain was falling harder than she'd expected. It was cold and harsh and came at a cross angle that hit her face and hair and blurred her vision once again. She stepped over to a covered area, even though it was brightly lit and someone passing might see her. She lifted her foot to the window ledge and poked the hole with her fingertip. She couldn't feel much, but to free her hand, she would have had to take the whole torso off. She wiped her eyes and rolled up her pant leg to get a better look. The cut was rough-edged and curved inward. It sat nowhere near a seam. Had the rip been closer to an existing scar, she might have been able to disguise it. Had her husband been any less meticulous, she could have folded it into a wrinkle or blended it with an aged spot. But he knew every nick and cut. Each had been his own mistake, a small worry he'd brought home to her with hope and gratitude that she might make it right. She'd worked to make sure the scars she left were minimal. A small discoloration on the arm where he'd burnt himself, a line where ankle met heel from when he'd slipped on the stairs. There was no hiding this one. She glanced up and saw herself reflected in the shop window. It was, shocked to see her own, it was a shock to see her own face there, sodden and strange, a middle-aged woman with a flap of empty skin hanging down the front of her shirt. She'd, worn her hair, she'd shorn her hair to fit more easily into the skin, and it gave her a gaunt, stern look. It was not how she pictured herself. In her bathroom mirror, when she wiped, when she wiped away the condensation and tried to see herself how strangers might, she felt insubstantial, as if anyone would look right past or see right through her. Beyond her reflection in the window was a cloud of fabric. No, not a cloud, a dress with a train so long it pulled at the floor and then swept out wide. Someone had pinned the train and train up in a giant spiral filling the display, the body nestled in its own periwinkle womb. It was draped with such audacity that for a moment the seamstress forgot about her leg. The dress seemed to both cradle itself and at the same time grow ever outward, expanding far from the body, piling excess without fear. Whoever had done this was not concerned with wearability or sales. The maker of this dress had created beauty for beauty's sake. It may have been a minute, it may have been 10, before the seamstress pulled her gaze away and took out her phone to call a car. 
There was nothing within a half an hour of her. Damn the rain. She pulled up her collar and headed the four blocks up to the nearest subway stop. The only people she passed had their heads down, covered in hoods or umbrella. None looked up or noticed her. She made it to the station and descended underground. It was warm and damp and smelled of earth and grime and human bodies. A train shuttled beneath her as she fed money into the metro card machine. She swiped it at the turnstiles and followed the signs pointing uptown. The platform held few people, a man reading a newspaper, another scrolling through his phone, a couple of well-dressed and tipsy teenagers leaning on, grimy pillar, on a grimy pillar near the stairs. None of them were interested in the seamstress or the flap of skin hanging down her front. Rain from the world above dripped from the grates, dampening the walls and bringing that loamy smell that exists nowhere else in the city. When the train arrived with its, with its usual rush of wind and noise, the few people waiting stood at attention. She let the young couple climb on first, then stepped on and found a seat before the toll sounded twice and the doors whispered shut. The seamstress sat on an orange bench watching her reflection flicker in and out of view on the window across, in the window across. In it, she saw the same stern face she'd seen in the storefront window earlier. It had not changed at all, it had not changed at all as if somehow she'd crystallized into some per someone permanent, a person who could no longer be overlooked. She didn't fiddle anymore with the cut on her leg. She knew her options. Given time, she could surely reduce it to almost nothing. She was an expert in repairing the small blemishes and minor mishaps of a life lived in this skin. There was a method of blending leathers that would require a patch twice the size of the hole. She could slice a square of her own calf as she'd done before. It would have to be tanned and cured and color matched, though. That would take weeks. Her husband, she knew, would notice the tear immediately. There was no hiding this, even if she did fix it. She had no choice. Her only option now was to go home and tell him what she'd done, to show him the first mark she'd ever left on him and find out what he might say. I brought a little five-pager, also, also kind of fantastical and weird. Yeah, OK, cool. This one's called 20 Babies. Um, this is a different character, but I don't know, maybe not, who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's a different joke. Um, she didn't mean to have 20 babies. It was an accident, the unexpected result of one wild night. But once they were inside her, she couldn't throw them out. She explored her options, talked to doctors and shamans and priests. All told her that 20 was too many for one woman, that either they would die or she would. But she couldn't choose between them. Who knew which would grow up to be the concert pianist, which the neurophysicist, which the sad, slow homebody she might love the most? And so, when they were quite small, a cluster of grapes, she stopped them from growing larger. They still developed, cells dividing and differentiating into hearts and lungs, ears and eyes. Their brains rippled in on themselves, folding and increasing. In sonograms, they looked fully formed, though their delicate fingers and toes were too small for the imaging systems to pick up. She saw each of their little faces pulse on the viewing screen, grainy and black and white. Throughout the second trimester, the specialist took samples, samples of fluid, samples of stool, cell samples scraped from the inside of her cheek. They recorded her family history, sequenced her DNA. They performed countless scans and predicted, predicted ever worse and more imminent outcomes. But she trusted her mother's instinct. Her 20 babies would be fine. The only thing she saw to worry about was how close they clustered. She had stopped their growth while there was still enough room before they crowded each other, squishing the outliers against the floor of her pelvis, the wall of her spine. And yet they remained in a tight ball, hugging one another, spooned and snuggling, intertwined. She wanted her children to know freedom, to swim and explore. She had given them space to develop, and yet they packed ever closer. Mothers worry, she told herself. Children must be who they are. So she ate her omegas and her folates and exercised regularly as the books and doctors recommended. She played Mozart and Bach and did deep breathing exercise to exercises to oxygenate their shared blood. And she let them bunch together as they wanted, trusting them to find their way. In the third trimester, the specialist became more vocal and more assertive, insisting on various complex plans and procedures. They lined up 20 incubators, kept a team of nurses on staff, ordered her to come in daily for checkups, threatened to induce on the 1st of June if nothing changed before then. 
As a mother, she quite, wasn't quite ready for the dramatic and traumatic ending they predicted. To be honest, she felt a bit alienated by all of the technical terms, the machines and wires. She continued to go, through her appointment, go to her appointments because she loved to see her 20 babies all perfect there inside of her, but eventually the pressure of so many professional opinions became too much. In late May, she watched her 20 babies in the monitor, nestled together and napping, and knew it was the last time she would see them that way. She thanked the doctors and nurses and left the clinic for good. How could any mother tear apart such a group? Even if the hospital engineered one special incubator to keep them all together and warm, eventually they would separate her babies, force them into clothes, give them names and genders and personalities, whether they were ready or not. They would get pushed into opinions and confrontations and educations, into relationships and careers. No, better they stayed inside of her and grew up at their own pace. They were too small for the outer world anyway and would have, to be, and would have been crushed by attention and expectation. So there they stayed, into the fourth and fifth trimester, into the sixth and seventh. They were still growing. She could feel it. It wasn't an increase in size or even density. How could anyone walk around with the weight of 20 toddlers inside? But they were growing nonetheless, growing in, not out. She spoke to them as she moved through the larger world, described the things she saw, animals, trees, hoped they might one day desire to see these things for themselves. But she didn't pressure them. They made sounds as well, ba the babbling of babies. They cooed and gurgled. They soothed each other's fears. Her favorite were the plumes of laughter that moved through the group, ignited by one tiny giggle, then spreading and changing until they were all there, together rolling and laughing and joyous inside her. They were happy babies, and she loved them all. It was early in their childhood, once she'd accepted that they had no plans to be born, that she began worrying about their futures. She didn't need them to excel in school or make lots of money or win prestigious humanitarian awards, but she knew that when they matured to a certain point, they would want love beyond the love she could give them, love beyond the kinship of siblings. No good mother would hold her child back from adulthood or stand in the way of romantic relationships, but how could she give her babies the world if their world remained inside of her? She couldn't return to the specialist for fear they'd cut her open and, and tie her down and force her into some climactic compromise. She was on her own. It was, up to her, it was up to her to give her children the lives they deserved. It wasn't an easy choice, but she knew what she had to do. The burden of 20 babies was already quite large, but she had to get pregnant again. At least she'd left some room. She spent months searching for a man as genetically diverse from the first father as possible. She was far more consci conscientious this time about family history, mental health, hereditary diseases, and predispositions. She knew that whenever new, uh, whatever new gene pool she introduced would be everything. It wasn't ideal that all of her babies would ha have half of her, but what choice was there? And civilizations had grown from less. She chose a stranger from the other side of the globe who had come to pursue his PhD and seduced him with oysters and Prosecco, luxuries he would not have bought on his grad student's budget. She didn't tell him about her 20 children or the 20 more she hoped to make that night, just sipped her single drink and filled his again and again until he bubbled over, warm and pliant. She took him in his apartment on a mattress on the floor and thanked him as she did, over and over, thank you, thank you, thank you. He palmed her round belly and cupped her thighs and thanked her in return. The, t the 20 babies were now 20 more, and her love for them doubled. She was relieved to think that there was a future in her for all of them. She carried them through her middle years as the first fine lines formed around her eyes, this tribe of playful children. Some were, of them were quiet, introspective. Others were wild. In times of strife, it seemed they were all fighting constantly inside of her, keeping her awake through the night. She tried to stop them, calm them down with soothing words and chocolate bars, but either they chose to ignore her or they no longer heard her, voice as, or heard her as a voice with meaning. Their language was not her own. What was once baby babble had developed into distinct words, but not words she could understand. Her children spoke only to one another. At times it made her lonely, isolated, even with 40 people inside. She imagined her voice was like an echo to them, or the wind, if they even heard her at all. Had her lullabies ever soothed? Had the Mozart mattered? What was it like in there? She couldn't fully imagine the scope of their world. She pictured it like the earth, only inverted, round and contained. Would they know the difference between day and night? Did they feel hungry, sad? 
She had not seen her 20 babies since the beginning, had not seen the next 20 at all, but she could feel them growing in her, changing, getting to know one another, forging bonds. The first rush of hormones that hit en masse was a shock to the system. She was riddled with mood swings, excess energy, heights and depths of emotion she hadn't felt since her own adolescence. But she survived, attending to her adult acne in the wells of self-consciousness and doubt. As her first 20 babies moved deeper into, her t into their teen years, she grew steadier, and by the time the second 20 reached puberty, she was ready. She had done it all before. Still, she was glad as they grew older, um, she was glad that as, they grew old, as she grew older, they did as well, calming down, settling. She didn't have it in her to stay up late or worry anymore. Her hair grew wet, gray, and she hoped they were finding one another, falling in love. Maybe there was an inventor or a musician among them. Maybe there was an athlete. Her skin sagged, and she imagined each of their lives, their joys and disappointment. She could hear them in there, more and more of them, it seemed, grandchildren, perhaps. Her joints weakened and her bones became brittle, but her stomach remained round and active. She wondered what they were doing sometimes, how they were all getting along. She worried, too, worried about the time when she could no longer take care of her children, no longer contain them. She would be dead and gone soon enough, but what could she do? This was life. They were grown now. They would take care of themselves. She hoped they had become more adventurous. She hoped they had become more adventurous with age, unnodding from that early group, venturing out to explore their world and each other. Or maybe their exploration worked in some opposite way that she couldn't quite conceive of. They would never leave her, she knew, never wake her way their way out into the outer world, but maybe they would continue in, creating space that she herself did not understand. That idea brought her comfort in the end, and she imagined them mapping her, sounding her depths, delving ever deeper, a universe within. Um, so now, um, usually we open up for questions if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I was really intrigued by your story, Tony Babies, and I was curious as to where you drew inspiration from. Um, I, I was wrestling for a lot of years about whether I was going to have kids or not. And so I started writing a series of uh, stories about impossible babies. Um, this is one of those stories. I ended up writing maybe like three or four of them and then giving up completely. Um, and then I wrote one very short story that listed all the impossible babies that I didn't get to write about. I think with this one, there was something about the sound of the words 20 babies that I just kept saying it over and over again in my head and being like 20 babies, 20 babies, 20 babies. And then thinking about kind of what that would mean. Um, and somehow I couldn't conceive of them past like past that, so that size. So I was like, okay, so they stop growing. Okay, they stay inside. So they just kind of suggested themselves. I think um, how weird and impossible they might be. That's, yeah. A lot of my stories come from uh, like an odd idea that I just want to see play out. Um, uh, Ken talked about uh, formal experimentation. I think um, if I can get just like an itch to scratch at, like either, either um, you know, let me tell this from a hundred different points of view, or um, what happens if a woman reads the same story every day for the rest of her life, or you know how how you know how would it feel to have this impossible pregnancy, and kind of what does that mean? It lets me play out kind of larger emotional stuff I'm going through uh, through through metaphor um, in a way that I like. So yeah, yeah, or. Yeah. So um, we read, I think, six of your stories, and um, I really, I like all of them, but um, in the view of the view from Union Square, mm -hmm. I was really intrigued by how you came up with so many different characters, and I was kind of wondering, do you have people that you just, like, borrow their names, and then... When I wrote that story, though, I wrote that story, um, I just read a story by Lee K. Abbott that took place like from three different points of view. And then I was like, well, what if every sentence in the story was a different point of view? And I, I set myself a goal of 100. So I'm going to write a story from 100 points of view. And then I was like, I had to pick a, a, 
an event to kind of center it around where a lot of people would be experiencing the same thing so you could jump like that. When I first wrote it though, um, I didn't have any of the names. I just wrote name, saw this, name did that, name did, and so it was this very kind of like repetitive um, list and they were all just name. And then I went back in um, and, and made up names um, with, with goals of kind of a little bit of diversity and an idea of kind of creating um, people who sounded like they could be real people, but um, none of them are anybody I know. Um, the place is a place that I that I know, Union Square, um, and I can picture the park bench, um, and and the event is something that I felt like enough would happen that I could get um, enough characters involved in it. Um, I only got up to like 84, I think, and it and it was done. Um, but so that was a that was a little disappointing. I didn't get all hundred, um, but what are you gonna do? Um, but yeah, they're not. No, those are those are not real people. And I'm glad that you felt like they were because um, I didn't. Sometimes I do feel very connected to my characters, and sometimes they're just like those were just like a lot of different puppets I put out. But if they were convincing at that length, I feel really good about that. Are you gonna ask a question? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I think you're really good at like character development and making characters feel like <laughs> kind of very real. It's hard. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering, when you like start a story, do you have a character in mind that you want to like, portray, or does it sort of develop as you go along? Um, it depends on the story. Um, a lot of times it's me. It's a lot of versions of me, um, and and it comes up in in different places than you would expect. So, if if a uh, if the protagonist starts as a version of me, it'll often be other characters coming in and saying saying weird stuff that I would say as well. Um, uh, usually, for if I if I go in trying to. I can't look too hard at the thing or it gets really dead really quick. And that's why I do the formal experimentation or the, the kind of odd ideas, because those can drive me forward in a way that um, kind of normal realist fiction just doesn't work for me. I love reading realistic fiction, um, but I find that when I'm writing it, I bore myself and the potential reader. Um, so usually if I'm looking at the experiment or I'm looking at the skin suit, then I can let the character come in on its own and I'm not trying to manipulate them or make them seem realistic. So it's kind of a game I play with myself to not focus too hard on, on, on that part of it because it, historically it's been harder for me to um, make people um, seem deep. Um, I, I, when I first started writing, I couldn't do dialogue, I couldn't, um, I could just like describe the wallpaper and maybe a scene, some scenery. Um, and so I had to practice over time uh, to be able to do that. And still I have to kind of fool myself into it sometimes so that I'm not making it too wooden um, or basic. Uh, yeah. And even these dating scenes uh, were horrible to write. Um, because I uh, am ter I, I, I haven't dated in, in many years, and so um, this idea of uh, all of a sudden I'm, a, I'm in my story and I have to go on a date uh, for two characters at once and uh, figure out what they're going to say to each other, and it didn't really make sense until I was like, oh, it's going to be a really awkward date, and then it kind of wrote itself, because I, that I can imagine, <laughs> you know. Um, So I don't know it. So the the second one I know I'm done with because it's out in the world and it's out of my hands. The seamstress one I'm still writing. I want it to be done, um, but I'm not sure if it is yet. Like, does she have to go all the way home and tell him? I don't think so. But maybe she needs like more of an epiphany or something like that. Um, a lot of times, sometimes, I I know the last line way ahead of time and I'm writing towards that especially with short short stories I can kind of see the ending and that's why I was writing shorter fiction for a long time because I was just I could just aim for that ending um, as I write longer pieces um, I don't always know um, sometimes I get worn out sometimes um, the thing that needs to happen has happened um, Sometimes I think it's done and I get feedback and someone tells me to cut the last two pages and so the ending turns out to be somewhere else. 
Um, I'd say revision and um, feedback from readers you trust is the best way um, to start getting a sense of that kind of thing. I do have like pretty traditionally art stories where they where they get that that kind of tension and climax and then we have to carry it a little further and have like a little breathing room afterwards and so I know I know when I've I've hit the kind of peak tension and I know when the the most upsetness should be um and so a little while after that maybe a page or two (laughs) and sometimes I try to finish them before they're really done and your reader will tell you immediately like um, the seamstress one actually ended at the shop window about a week ago, and then my friends were like, yeah, no, I was still leaning forward. There's more here. And just having her get on the train and kind of um, knowing she, what she's going back to were important. So maybe, uh, maybe a few more tweaks on that one. But I don't know. It's, it's no telling. Each story is different, too. So. Sometimes you just run out of words, like with the view from Union Square, like, there was nowhere left for him to go. He was he was in the morgue, like and you're out of, and you can't get those last sixteen characters, wh- whether you want to or not. You know. Yeah. So I feel like in my classes we talk a lot about um, ideas and characters and details and layers and how to bring a character to life, but also we talk a lot about language and working with language and how <coughs> to sort of smooth out sentences or and, you know punctuation or whatever. Um, how, how much, like, when you think about like ideas for the stories, working with those, and then working with language in a story, how do those, how do you, are those things just completely, no, they're really, you write, or do you spend, you know, time and years language is really important to me, so I got most of the way through graduate school for creative writing, and I got mad, and I was like, why don't we ever talk about language, like the poets get to talk about language, and that is like the heart of why we read and what we care about, but all we ever talk about is like, is this character realistic, or, you know, tell me more about the mother, or show don't tell, and these kind of straightforward, oh, I keep hitting the mic, these really um, straightforward things that you need to know how to do, but language is the beautiful part, and, and, and in some ways it's the most important part, um, and I've been kind of for years trying to figure out how how do I make this more beautiful? How do I um, do linguistically something interesting? And I think you guys uh, read, um, some of you may have read this dolphin story that I wrote. Um, That one to me opened up in a way, as soon as I realized that it was a language lesson, right? That the sounds that she was making and the sounds that he was hearing were were central to what was happening. I was like, oh, this is a sound story. And I just started, I started back at the beginning and started flowing through like the, the commands, the ee, e, ah, ah, and the, and the trilling breet and the way, so the way those sounds mattered in that story kind of opened up for me this thing I've been trying to do with language for all these years. And um, when you're first starting to write, uh, everyone talks about finding your voice, right? And so my voice is a little bit academic. It's a little bit, um, I use big words uh, in my daily speech. Um, I, uh, I sound like a middle-aged white lady who teaches English. And so is that an interesting voice to start from? Not really, okay? So, but there are parts of that that are. So if I can kind of tap into the parts that are interesting, like the, po- the poetry in those words and the way it sounds and, and make it matter to the character the same way it matters to me, um, then, then maybe there's more of a point. And I think with these, these more kind of fairy tale or fantastical stories, I get a little more play in, in terms of formal language. Um, I spend a lot of time wondering if I should use conjunctions or not, changing did not to didn't uh, and back again over and over again. Um, and, and a lot of my um, attention to language is just paring down, like I'll write it, I'll just cut words, see how many, how, if I can do it in fewer words um, and tighten it up. Um, a lot of it's intuitive though, I, like I don't have a plan, I don't know a lot about poetic meter, um, but it's the way it sounds in my head. Um, And I think a lot of that I got from reading um, lots and lots of books growing up. And so, so I've kind of have a sense of what I, what that voice sounds like. Um, Language, I don't know. I don't know how to teach language and I don't know, and I don't know that I've ever ever been taught it. And I kind of wish I had, I wish I had um, 
the guts to go and fail at poetry for a few years um, and so that I could if you've ever read um, prose written by poets like their essays are just like crystalline and, and striking and gorgeous um, and they just have this 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 whole artist palette that that I can like only tap into a little bit so I I love language and wish to focus on it more but I do what I can I have no formal approach. You feel like the shorter pieces allow you to do that? Yeah, because you can just compress, compress, compress. And a lot of times, um, there's, there are a bunch of contests and, and, and publications that want certain word lengths of like 500 or 1,000 words. And turning a 1,500-word story into a 1,000-word story will get you a tightness of language that you can't get any other way. And so that like a project of just cutting a third of your words might get you that kind of crystalline structure that you're looking for. Um, and then sometimes I'll expand out from there because it needs more things to happen. And I'll say, okay, it's not a, it's not a short, short. It's good. Like the seamstress story, um, the first page or whatever, we're just putting on the skin and going out. That was a whole story, I thought. And then I was like, oh, I bet she could go on some Tinder dates. That might be good. <laughs> and so I had to keep writing on that one. But yeah, often, often I start with just that, that kind of very short, very compressed approach uh, they're more fun and you feel satisfied and you like you finish something and you're like I'm the greatest I just wrote another story <laughs> and if someone publishes it you're like oh I just published another story and they're easier to publish because they're so short and it's like a, it's just a, like a circle win all the time except you write you write like 20 stories and you definitely don't have a book yet because it's like because <laughs> it's like 15 pages total um, other questions yeah um, going off of um, sort of language and you know finding uh, a specific voice for a given story, um, how much of that is like premeditated before you finally start uh, putting pen to paper? I guess I'm just interested in how, I'd how say you work on like like pre-writing planning. None. None. No. Um, not well. Not none. None. But so the only time I'm pre-writing is if I don't have a story in the works or I'm bored by whatever I'm writing. So I'll, I'll journal and free write, and often my free writes start like, what should I write about? Nothing to write, everything's boring, life sucks. And then I'll be like, well, this happened the other day, or what happened if blah, 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 or like, um, depending on, you know, um, and I'll, or I'll start writing down all my impossible babies, so this long list of impossible babies. And somehow, maybe on like the third or fourth or 20th thing that I write down, then I, I have a sentence for it somehow, like I can describe it, so I just write that sentence and like, more times than not, I found myself starting from this listing thing and then, and then moving into a good sentence and following it with another good sentence and realizing I have just written a paragraph and I was like, oh, free paragraph, throw it into another file and start a story from there. So more often than not, those voice, the voice will come to me um, through free writing, um, and so I don't, I don't tend to plan it out, um, and sometimes it's because a, a sound caught me, like 20 babies, 20 babies, like that just like rolled around in my head until I had to write it down. Um, with, the, with the dolphin story, that's based on a true story, so I, I read about that, and I was like, how do I write a story about dolphin sex and LSD and all this stuff? That one I had to find a voice for. I, I had to figure out that it was about motherhood and that it was about um, sound in that specific way. But for the most part, um, I come to it through kind of, most of what I do um, craft or for my own writing is try to unblock myself and not second guess and not shut myself down because I'm a much more powerful editor than I am like a at, than I am at generating text. So anything I can do to let myself make more, I'll do that because I know the editor is going to come down hard and cut a third of the story no matter what, and they're going to throw out things and they're going to doubt and you know they have to walk I have to walk away for long periods of time if I'm editing too hard. Um, so usually I let the that those voices come from a more intuitive place and and not a planned place. Um, but that might also just be, cu be because I've been doing it for a while. Um, I would say another great technique is to steal voices from people you know. Um, not in like an Ursula Sea Witch type way, but like just listen to people and see how their um, 
how their their speech patterns work and what's quirky or interesting about them and then try to imitate that and kind of um, that's a great way to find voice um, but yeah a lot of them they just they show up for me which is I appreciate you kind of build a practice of writing um, and hope and, and if you show up often enough that the the good stuff comes as well